Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for this Sunday, April 18th, 2021. I'm really reader Zach Cosner. I invite you to download the bulletin for today's service, which can be found in the link below this video on Facebook and on YouTube. You can also head to our website, www.centralpresspb.com. Uh, click on the publications link at the top of the webpage. Scroll down until you see today's date. Once you click on the date, you will download the, uh, the PDF of the bulletin for today's service. Uh, you can read that on a mobile device or on a tablet, or feel free to print it out so you can follow along during today's worship service. Uh, now that you have the bulletin in front of you, I ask that you turn your attention to the announcements found at the back of the bulletin. Uh, the session of CPC has decided to stick with virtual services for the foreseeable future. Keep in contact with us via social media with username Central Press TV or on our website for announcements about any special services and when we plan to resume in-person in worship. My hope is, is that we have uh, news about that reopening schedule uh, coming in the next few days. Archives of our online services can be found on Facebook and on YouTube. Links to each are on our website, centerpresstv.com. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord. In life, in death, in life beyond death, Jesus Christ is Lord. Over powers and principalities, over all who determine, control, govern, or finance the affairs of humankind, Jesus Christ is Lord. Of the poor, of the broken, of the sinned against, and the sinner, Jesus Christ is Lord. Above the church, beyond our most excellent theologies, and in the quiet corners of our hearts, Jesus Christ is Lord. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us in our weaknesses, since in every respect he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with boldness approach the throne of grace and find grace to help him, a uh, help, excuse me, and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, first using the prayer print in the bulletin in, in unison and then silently. Eternal God, through your love we are your children, yet we confess that we do not recognize your son, our brother, as he works among us. We look for him in grand and noble places, but pass by as he keeps, keeps the watch with the broken and the wounded among us. Forgive us, O oh God, open our minds to understand your teaching. Open our ears that we, might hear, that we might hear and heed the cries of the needy. And open our eyes that we may see our risen Lord and join him in his work. And now silently. Amen. The good news in Christ is that when we face ourselves in God with the awareness of our need, we are given grace to grow, encouraged to continue the journey. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Uh, this week, unfortunately, Rose was not able to provide a children's sermon, so now we're going to go and turn it over to Reverend Tim Reeves. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our first reading this morning is the fourth psalm. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O oh Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord. Make me lie down in safety. <clears throat> in our second reading this morning, 
come from the first epistle of John, beginning in the second chapter with verse 28, and proceeding through chapter 3, verse 10. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. And now, little children, abide in him so that when he is revealed, we may have confidence and not be put to shame before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who does right has been born of him. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born of God do not sin because God's seed abides in them. They cannot sin because they have been born of God. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All who do not do what is right are not from God, nor are those who do not love their brothers and sisters. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear. That hearing we might believe and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. Once upon a time, there was a city that was adorned with a beautiful statue, and this huge sculpture called the Happy Prince was covered with gold, and stood on a high pedestal above the city, looking down upon it with its blue sapphire eyes and guarding his dominion with a sword which had a priceless ruby embedded in its hilt. One night a swallow landed wearily at the prince's feet. Before he could fall asleep, the bird felt a cascade of water pouring down upon him, and he looked up and saw that the happy prince was crying, for he could see from his high vantage point above the city a sick child begging his mother for an orange while she worked with bleeding fingers to embroider a gown for a rich woman. Swallow, said the happy prince, stay with me tonight and be my messenger. The boy is so thirsty and the woman so sad. The swallow agreed to the prince's request and following his instructions took the ruby from the sword and dropped it on a table next to the thimble of the woman who now rejoiced because she had enough money for herself and her son to live. The next day, the prince saw a young rider in a garret who was so cold that 
he could not hold the pen properly to write and finish his play. So the happy prince had the swallow pluck out one of his sapphire eyes and carry it to that young playwright who used it to buy coal for his heart. The next day, the prince saw a little girl who sold matches, but they had fallen into the river and were now useless. So the prince told the swallow to take his other sapphire eye and give it to the girl who was then able to buy more supplies and sell them and make a profit. At this sight, or at this point, the swallow realized that he could not leave the sightless prince alone for very long, so he stayed to act as his eyes and to pull off one piece at a time the gold leaf from his body to bring to those who were suffering. Finally, one day, the prince was completely stripped bare of his riches. He had given everything, everything, his ruby, his sapphires, all of his gold leaf. The swallow also had given its all. Because the bitter cold weather that now was upon them told him that he should have flown south long before now. In a last effort, the swallow flew up kissed the prince's lips and fell dead at his feet. And at that, the leaden heart of the happy prince snapped in two. Over time, the townspeople, disgusted at the eyesore that the prince had become, tore it down, tore the statue down, and melted it in a blast furnace. But the broken heart refused to melt, and thus the townspeople tossed it and the body of the dead swallow to the side. Looking down upon earth, God said to one of his angels, bring me the two most precious things from that city. And the angel returned with the broken heart and the dead swallow. To which God said, you have chosen rightly. For in my garden of paradise, this little bird shall sing forever, and in my city of gold, the happy prince will praise me. That, of course, is Oscar Wilde's story entitled The Happy Prince, which I find to be a tale of great love and beauty, a story of how one willingly gave everything he had so that others might live. And as such, I believe it is a wonderful parable about the love of God exhibited in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Because out of a great love for humanity, the word of God became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. Out of love for humanity, our Lord did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. Out of love of humanity, Jesus Christ endured the pain and shame of the cross, that we might have life, and that in abundance. And with the resurrection of our Lord, the world was awakened to any number of new possibilities. Whereas the old life was marked by failure and shame, doubt and fear, defeat and despair, the new life is one of confidence and joy and hope. But certainly not least among these possibilities is the fact that we are not only reconciled to God, but that this relationship with God is an intimate and loving one. As we heard from our reading from 1 John this morning, see what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. That joyful sentiment is echoed in the fourth psalm where the psalmist utters, but know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. 
And I can think of few phrases as comforting and reassuring and inspiring as the acknowledgement that we are children of God. And to be children of God means that we are loved by someone who knows us better than we will ever know ourselves. It means that no matter where we are and no matter what circumstances we may find ourselves in, we know where we belong. It means that we can venture into the unknown with boldness because win, lose, or draw, we will always be welcomed with open arms by the one who truly revels in our existence. And that is important for us to remember because though we find great acceptance in the presence of God, oftentimes we experience just the opposite in the world. First John tells us the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And what that comment does is connect Christ even more closely with believers. We share a common experience of being unrecognized and unrecognizable by the world. But that comment also indicates that believers are known to be children of God precisely because they are rejected by the world. It is not our glory or power or beauty which sets us apart as God's children, but rather we are set apart because we are rejected just as our Lord was rejected. Why is that? Well, to put it plainly, it's because the children of God exhibit certain family traits, the same family traits that Jesus himself exhibited. Someone once noted that if a child lives with criticism, then the child learns to condemn. If a child lives with hostility, then he learns to fight. If a child lives with ridicule, he learns to be shy. If a child lives with shame, he learns to feel guilty. If a child lives with tolerance, he learns to be patient. If a child lives with encouragement, he learns confidence. If a child lives with praise, he learns to appreciate. And if a, a child lives with fairness, he learns justice. If a child lives with security, he learns to have faith. And if a child lives with approval, he learns to like himself. If a child lives with acceptance and friendship, he learns to find love in the world. As children of God, we have learned not only that we are loved, but also that such love is to be shared. We have learned that we are not to fret about our own safety and security, but rather to live lives of boldness, because in life and in death, we belong to God. And within these verses from 1 John, we are reminded of some of the other family traits that we have learned as God's children. For instance, as children of God, who is a righteous God, we should not be surprised that doing righteousness is a family trait. By doing righteousness, I mean being involved in righting the wrongs of society confronting injustice in all its forms, be it racism, classism, or sexism, feeding the poor, and confronting the social structures that impoverish people in the first place, living in peace with our neighbors and exhibiting a love for all people which transcends all national boundaries. Exhibiting such a family trait certainly landed Jesus in hot water on more than one occasion, and it will continue to incur the world's wrath from a society more focused on its own self-centered well-being. 
A second family trait is that we, as children of a holy God, are to live holy lives. Put another way, it matters to God how we live our lives. Life is not an anything-goes proposition. Hence, John's words, no one who abides in him sins, no one who sins has either seen him or known him. Now, on the surface, were we to take these words out of context, this would seem to contradict what we read from 1 John last week, which said, said, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But what John here is addressing in these words was the fact that we all stand in need of God's grace. And what John is addressing in this morning's passage is what happens when we refuse to acknowledge sin as sin. In other words, what John is confronting in these verses was those who equated lawless behavior with righteousness and then who said it really didn't matter how they acted because they were, after all, God's children. A split had occurred in the church to which John was writing. And one thing that had divided that particular church was a conflict over the relationship between faith and action. Those who left the community believed that one's status as a child of God meant that it did not matter what they said or did. John's words, however, contradicted such a belief. Not only did it matter what they said, but it also mattered how they lived their lives of faith. The very fact that one does what is right, says John, is evidence of the fact that one is truly a child of God. If you profess to be God's child, then your life should bear more witness to that than your words ever could. Which leads to a third family trait. Love for one another. I'm reminded of the story of a mother who was preparing pancakes for her two sons, Kevin, age five, and Ryan, age three. And they began to argue over who would get the first pancake. Well, their mother saw here an opportunity for a moral lesson. So she asked them, she said, if Jesus were hit, sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Who will follow that example? At this point, Kevin turns to Ryan and says, you be Jesus. And we can chuckle at that, perhaps. But in loving one another, we are in essence being Jesus. We are following our Lord's example of serving others and putting the needs of others before our own. And we can see how important this is when we consider the way our Lord said the world would treat his disciples. In John's gospel, one of the things that Jesus tried to convey to his disciples was that if the world hated him, it would hate them. That's nothing new. Because even this morning, Saul addresses such a predicament. But the last thing that we as people of faith need is to face attacks from without as well as from within the community of believers. We need each other for mutual encouragement. We need each other to help bear our burdens. We need each other to be a source of strength and consolation when it seems that evil is attacking us from all sides. And the only way that such things can happen is when we are certain that everyone in the community is truly focused on the well-being of everyone else. So on this, the third Sunday of Easter, 
May we all exhibit such family traits in our service to God and one another. And to God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. Will you please join with me as we profess what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our tithes and offerings this morning will be taken electronically. We invite you to head to our website, www.centralpresspb.com, and look for the Donate Now link at the top of the webpage. We accept debit and credit cards, and you may also re uh, set up recurring donations at, uh, uh, on that website. If you do not feel comfortable with tithing online, we do accept checks and money orders. And you can mail those to 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. Let us pray. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gifts of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and for your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life in your midst. And your Holy, Son, the Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, call us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, in our great gratitude, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, indeed our very selves, as you, for you to use as you see fit, until that most glorious day when, at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend, and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. As we turn to our time of sharing joys and concerns, I would like to inform you that Dominic Mon went to the doctor this week and his lengthening is going well. They did have to slow it down. He goes back uh, for a follow-up visit in two weeks. Brad Von Toglin is out of ICU and is doing better. We thank God for that, uh, but continued prayers are uh, appreciated. Haley Chandler is having issues with her chemo and radiation. She has started to lose weight and is slowing down. They are in the process right now of dropping an NG tube to get liquids in her to keep her weight up and hopefully give her energy a boost. Uh, continued prayers are appreciated. Jane Glover is back home after her bypass surgery and continued prayers are appreciated for her as well. Let us turn our thoughts, our hearts, and our minds to God in prayer. Holy God, we thank you that even before we utter a word, you know the request on our lips and are far more willing to give than we are to receive. We pray that you will continue to watch over all people everywhere as the world continues to struggle with this COVID-19 pandemic. Be a special light and blessing, O oh God, to the men and women on the front lines administering health care and vaccines. We pray a special prayer for those who continue to be isolated from 
family and friends because of COVID. May they know your abiding and eternal presence. And may they find in you a source of strength, love, and endurance. Holy God, we thank you that Dominic continues to recover from his surgery and pray that you will continue to watch him and bless him in his healing. We give you gratitude that Brad is out of ICU and that he is doing better and ask that you will bless and heal him. We pray for Haley as she is undergoing chemo and radiation and offer our heartfelt prayer that this NG tube will indeed give her the fluids and energy she needs to continue to fight the good fight. And we thank you that Jane is home from surgery and recuperating and pray that you will continue to be a source of healing and wholeness. We lift up to, O oh God, those who are known only to you. Heal them in body, mind, or circumstance, working in them by your grace wonders beyond all they may dream or hope. All this we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go out into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing always in the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit and exhibiting the fa family traits of righteousness, holiness, and love as God's own children. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore.